So, you don't like to pay rent? <laughs> this is the plaintiff, Christopher Shaw. He says he was forced to hire an attorney to evict the defendant from a house he owned. Turns out the defendant is a professional rent scammer who's been evicted numerous times before. Moving forward, he's learned a very valuable lesson about doing the proper research on prospective tenants for the future. But right now, he wants the $700 the defendant owes him, and that's why he's suing. This is the defendant, Lashonda Harris. She says the plaintiff is a landlord from you know where. It was terrible renting from him, and she most definitely doesn't owe him a thing. That's right. Let's see if he can walk out of here with any more of her money. No way he's going to win. No way. No way. No way at all. She's accused of being a troubled tenant. The defendant is filed a countersuit for $657.65 for all she's out. All parties, please raise your right hand. What you are about to witness is real. The participants are not actors. They are actual litigants with a case pending in civil court. Both parties have agreed to drop their claims and have their cases settled here before Judge Marilyn Millian in our forum, the People's Court. Be seated, come to order, please. <laughs> litigants have been sworn, Your Honor. Thank you, Douglas. Okay, Christopher Shaw, you are suing LaShonda Harris for $700 in attorney's fees that you expended in an eviction case against her. You are counterclaiming against him $657.65 in fees you do not feel you should have incurred and feel are his fault that you had to spend those monies. All right, let's start with you. She was a tenant in a house or an apartment? In a house, private house, Your Honor. Okay, and she was renting the whole house? Yes, Your Honor. All right, and it was you and who else was living there? Me and my three children. Three children. All right, now the, Section 8 was helping you pay your yes. rent? And Section 8 is a government program that, uh, based upon need, might help people to pay their rent? Exactly. All right, you lived there for how long? Um, approximately 11 and a half months. All right, and then what went wrong from your perspective? Well, um, the first two months, I had no problems with Ms. Harris. She paid her rent on time. And then from then on, she just stopped paying. Wait, did you go pick it up and she wasn't there? What would happen when, when you go I, pick it up? When I went to pick it up, she told me she didn't have it. And um, I also n noticed that I had destruction of property. And um, I didn't really care for Ms. Harris was being very disrespectful to me. Disrespectful to me. And um, so you wanted to break the lease. You wanted to, to want end the lease because you yes. felt that she was destroying your property. Yes, that too. So you filed a case in November with a lawyer. Yes. For eviction. Yes. And what happens with that case? Well, my my lawyer was negotiating with the Section Eight coordinator and East Orange Housing Authority, and um, I have emails with the negotiation and. They were scheduling, scheduling for Ms. Harris to move to another place. Right. And I saw, those, I saw those emails. Your lawyer tells the worker for Section 8 that if she moves out, you'll dismiss the case. And then she moved out and you dismiss the case. Was there yes. ever any negotiation to cover your attorney's fees? No, there was no negotiation to cover my attorney fee. Did Your you tell Honor. your lawyer you wanted him to negotiate that? Well, my lawyer had mentioned it to me. And what happened was uh, my lawyer, I think her father had passed away, so I didn't get to talk to her for a few months, but she advised me to file a complaint in regards to my attorney fee for $700. Do you have proof that you paid the lawyer $700? Yes, Your Honor. May I see it? I have a receipt. So you don't like to pay rent? <laughs> <laughs> It's not that I don't like to pay rent. I paid my rent to him. I have my receipts. Okay, so show me receipts for um, rent from August until you moved out in February. Okay, hold on one second. Okay, this is the receipt for $160. That was a retainer for NI. Uh, do you have proof that you paid a lawyer? You're you've come to court to sue for a $700 fee you paid a lawyer 
May I please see the proof of the very thing you've come to court to sue for? Well, I spoke to my attorney, and my attorney told me that the retainer was sufficient. And you need a new attorney. <laughs> all this could possibly prove is that you paid $160. That's the best this can prove, because that's all this says. How could this prove you paid 10000 or 700 or 1700 or 17000 It can't prove something other than what it says. Yes. If your attorney really told you that, you need a new attorney. Yeah. But that's kind of insane that you come to court to sue for something that you brought no proof of. Well, I don't know why I say it's insane. It happens to me every day. Um, I'm sorry, but that's that right there is for October. I don't have the other ones, but here's a here's the paperwork. I thought you said here. you paid all the time and you had yeah, receipts all the time. No, he does. What it is is Chris doesn't come with receipts when he comes to collect then your don't money. Don't pay him my money. I have you have to a piece of toilet paper eight. in your house? That's why I have do this. Do you that's have a piece of toilet paper in your house? Yes, Your do Honor, you have that's a why I have this. Do you have a crayon? Yes, I okay. do. Okay, then you take the nearest roll of toilet paper and the nearest crayon, and then you know how to do it. So show me if you paid it, because you know how to do it. Yeah, but I don't have it all. And if I write it now in front of you, that would be a lie. So I don't okay. have it all. I don't think you're picking right up what here. I'm putting down, woman. I'm no, not I'm asking for you to forge it. I'm asking for you, if you paid it, don't no. pay it unless you get a well, receipt. Here, here's October. That's all you got, October and all those months? Yeah, because any other month he was coming to pick it up with no problem. Then once it came time for him to pay for the oil, which his, he was responsible for come September, Wait, he straight who he's the responsible. You've said that, and that's part of your counterclaim against him. It's in the lease. But show me in the lease where it says he has to pay oil. Who's supposed to pay the oil? Me. Is it in the lease? Yes, yes, Your Honor. Is that the agreement you had with her for you to pay the oil? Yes. Yes? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, you can stop looking. Whether it's in there or not, he just said he had that agreement with you. So, all right, now, so the next question that I have for you is, you think he just made himself scarce any time oil needed to be purchased? Yes, that is true. I have the receipts to show that I purchased oil. How many times did oil. you purchase oil? Um, I purchased oil over 10 times, but... How much money did you spend purchasing oil? Over a thousand dollars and some change, and I have the receipts to prove it. And did you ever tell? Did you ever tell him I'm deducting from the rent I owe you the thousand dollars? No. This is how it went. East Orange Property Maintenance came through, and I only had to move out because I was forced to move out because they said to me that I had to pay the rent. Now, oh, through Section 8. You're the little part of the rent you have to pay. Now, yes, through okay. Section 8, they call East Orange Housing Authority. East Orange Housing Authority came in. The temperature of the house was under whatever. I have the reports. They're saying that it was unsafe for my 7-year-old to be there because my two older children was of I'm age. I'm not understanding you. You moved out because it was condemned? No, I moved out because they were saying that he claimed to Section 8 that he didn't know that I was putting the oil in. Section 8 told me no longer put the oil in after I gave them the receipts to prove that I was putting the oil in. They're giving me 30 days to move or they were going to take my seven-year-old away from me. So I had no wait, choice. Wait, stop. I Who, can show you the report. Housing authority said they'd take your kid away. No, that's not what I said. They said that they will call DIFUS to have DIFUS take my child away, which is BCW in New if York. If you continue to live. In the house with no heat. Because a man came and he gave me oil three separate times without Chris's permission. And what he said was, I can no longer give you oil unless we speak to Mr. Shaw. That's not true, Your Honor. I have the um, oil receipts. Okay, she has oil receipts. Show me your oil receipts. Bank statements, too. How often do you guys have to fill up the oil? Look, what happened was she, she agreed to pay for the oil because I had a six-bedroom house and uh, she had a four-bedroom voucher, so she made an oil, oil, oral agreement with me that she would pay for the oil delivery. So she made that agreement with me. No, I did not. <laughs> Okay. No, I did and not. Then she decided Why that she couldn't she afford the oil. You? What in return for you doing what for her? Because what happened was I gave her two extra bedrooms in the house. Uh, six, it was a six-bedroom house. Does Section Eight know anything about this? So we're well, doing we, this kind we, of under the table without Section Eight knowing. Welcome back to the People's Court. Harvey Levin here. Do you think um, the system is unfair to landlords? Absolutely. What do you say? Uh, they have a right to make a decent living, and they're giving someone a place to live, and someone's disrespecting them. They should have the right to get rid of them. Do you think tenants abuse the system a lot? I think a lot of times they do, yeah, definitely. Unfair to landlords? Oh, yeah, that's big. Unfair. I'm interested. Are you a tenant or a landlord? 
I am actually a uh, landlord now. Oh, oh, I was wondering, I thought, oh God, that's such a nice thing you said. You're a landlord, it's all self-interest, right? Yeah, yeah no, no. got your point, go inside the courtroom. I could have got a Section 8 tenant with a six bedroom voucher and it would have covered everything, all the expenses, but she wanted the six bedroom house for her I children, want a six house. and <laughs> and she made an oral agreement with me in the beginning that she would pay for the that she would pay the oil with and the then voucher. She, no, she was going to pay for it herself. And then what happened? She had financial difficulties. She couldn't pay for it. So then I took over the oil payments for oil, oil payments for for her. Start talking. He's lying. And I got to tell you, that has a kind of ring of truth to it. That's, that doesn't even make any sense because Section 8 came out to do the inspection before I moved into the home with a four bedroom voucher. Through Section 8, if your rent is, let's just say for example, your voucher is a four bedroom, but your voucher dollar is sixteen seventy five, you can get a 10 bedroom house as long as your voucher amount doesn't go over the sixteen seventy five. He's not telling the truth. I never agreed to paying no oil. No, I never. You know what? I don't know why I'm wasting my time because I really, I don't want to try to figure out what fraud was being committed on, on Section 8 or help you to get the benefit of your fraud. If you're trying to do something behind Section 8's back, then you should both get in trouble with Section 8. Um, my, I have enough jobs here. All right. Okay. So let's talk about this. How much was her rent a month? Um, around $400 a month. How much was your- telling the truth. Okay, show me, prove to me for, through the Section 8 documents what your portion of the rent was. This <coughs> is for September, you okay. see, mm -hmm. September. And then it changed again in another month? October, yes, because okay. what it is is- It's fine, and then from October forward, it's the same? Uh-huh. Okay, got it. Show me proof that you had to evacuate because there was no oil. This is from the inspector. Wait, I'm sorry. This is from the inspector. Just give me the proof that you had to leave. I'm giving it to you now. Okay, so hand it all at once. And that one too. Okay. Show me where they tell you you have to evacuate. Um, East Orange, East Orange property. You, can you show me, listen to my here question. I don't want to hear any more where you tell me about it. Okay, that's what, I've asked for that document. Let's see if this says it. You have to evacuate. That's well, none, of, none of them say none that of I have You don't to. have a stitch of paper that says you have to evacuate. Okay. No, none of them Got say it. that I have the to evacuate. The lease then would have gone on until when? It would have gone on until February. February 1st. 20, okay. 20, All right. 2014. And you acknowledge that your lawyer sent an email to the housing authority saying if your client leaves, we will drop the case. You acknowledge that? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, now nobody talk anymore. Okay? Okay. okay. All right. So what you did in your counterclaim is you deducted the amounts that you'd paid for the oil from what you perceive is the rent that you owed. The yes. rent that you owed, according to my calculations, taking into account the receipt that you showed me for October and how your rent fluctuated and changed, would be a total of $2,517. If I subtract from that, all your oil bills, and I ignore this testimony about a side deal and all this other stuff, then that would mean that you are still owing in rent and were able to get away with not paying $984 in rent. Which, if in fact that's the case, you should not collect any money on your counterclaim because you would still owe rent. So on your counterclaim against him, zero. Now let's talk about your attorney's fees. You have come to court to sue for one simple thing, $700 in attorney's fees. And you have brought to court no proof of $700 in attorney's fees. Yes. I've never seen anybody do that. I've seen lots of people come to court unprepared. But I have never seen anybody come to court so unprepared that they cannot get a receipt from their lawyer for $700 if they paid the lawyer $700. It's yes. inexplicable that you would come into court to sue for one thing and not have the proof of it and only have a piece of paper that says $160. So there's no excuse for you coming here without any proof of that, okay? Yes. But aside from that, I have a settlement in an email between your lawyer and them that if she leaves, you'll drop the case. And now you're trying to revive the case and get $700 in attorney's fees out of it when that's not something that you got in the other case. So on your claim against her, zero. And on her claim against you, zero. 
Good luck, folks. Well, Judge Millian unravels this mystery. Come on up here a little bit. Stay a little closer here and t t tell me what your feeling is on this verdict here. Well, I can't complain. Um, the judge makes a lot of sense with her decision. I wish um, I had my receipt for $700 instead of the retainer. But like I said, um, my attorney was having some problems and she couldn't give me that copy. If you can't come to court with evidence, then you can't expect to win, win the decision. Yes, I agree. All right, so head around the corner that way, and let's see what uh, what the defendant has to add to this. Uh, there was no blood on either side. What, what's your feeling coming out? I mean, it's, it's okay. Once a liar, always a liar, so it's okay. He'll get it in the end, so it's okay. He will? Yes, he most definitely will. When you lie, nothing good happens for you, so it's okay. Okay, Harvey. Got to say, Kurt, uh, it is bizarre and suspicious. Uh, not having a key piece of evidence, it is a deal breaker. And that will do it for this case. Litigants for the next case on the way into the courtroom right now. This is the plaintiff, Ursi Greenwood. He says he's a paralegal, and he struck up a barter deal with the defendant. He would handle the guy's bankruptcy, and the defendant, who owns an auto repair shop, would replace the engine in his car. Well, it's been more than a year. The guy's done nothing, and he's suing the louse for $6,565.45. The amount he's owed. This is the defendant, Zenato Beltran. He says the plaintiff pretended to be a lawyer when he met him at the courthouse handing out flyers. They struck up a conversation and he did work on the guy's 17-year-old BMW. He worked on the thing for a year, stored it in his shop, and this big mess of a lawsuit is all the plaintiff's fault because he didn't have money to buy a new engine. He's accused of taking his sweet time. All parties, please raise your right hands. Welcome back to the People's Court. Next case in the docket. The plaintiff is a paralegal, made a deal with the defendant. The plaintiff would do the defendant's right. bankruptcy. The defendant would fix the plaintiff's car engine, but he got no engine. The defendant says the plaintiff scammed him by pretending to be a lawyer, and he did the work. It's the case of you're going belly up just like me. Thank you, Douglas. Ursi Greenwood, you are suing Senaido Beltran and Nito's Automotive Repair. Are you the owner? Yes, ma'am. Okay. For $6,565.45 that you say he owes you for a new paint job, uh, insurance for, on your car for a year and a half, and the return of a deposit that you gave to him. Okay. What happened? Uh, what happened, uh, Your Honor, is that I brought my car to uh, Needles Auto Repair on May 31st, uh, 2000. How did you pick him to do your repair? I, uh, my worker... Uh, pass, passes out flyers in front of the uh, courthouse, and he uh, he spoke to uh, Zanato there at the courthouse about okay. doing uh, some legal work. I would do some legal work for him. Okay. Are you a lawyer? Uh, paralegal. And so you he called you? I actually called uh, Zanato. Okay. So you called him and said? I called him and said that I needed repairs on my uh, vehicle. Okay. And he said, you know, you could just bring it in. So I uh, brought it in, and the agreement was that uh, I would give him a deposit of $800, and then there would be a balance of $1,850, which made the deal $2,650. I was to do uh, a bankruptcy for him, which I did complete, and he signed off on. And the repair work involved what? The repair work involved uh, replacing my engine. So what happens? Do you have the paperwork for the bankruptcy that you completed? Uh, no, I do not have that with me. According to you, he never completed any bankruptcy? No, ma'am. According to you, you thought he was a lawyer? Yes, ma'am. All right, tell me about that. Um, actually, his car broke down on the freeway, on 110 freeway in California, and he brought the car to my shop. And we started talking about it, if he can help me with the bankruptcy. So he said, yeah, I could do that. So you create this little barter situation. Yes, Is the assistant who was handing out flyers here? No. no. All right. So uh, um, according to you, you work out the deal that you're going to pay 18, how much did you say? No, Eight, $20. No, $800. 800 for, you gave him. For the deposit. Right. Yeah, and then eight, the balance would be 1850 Okay. And then what happens? I go up there numerous times asking him, oh, what's, what's the status on my car? Why is it my uh, car What ready? kind of car is this? It's a BMW. What year? It's a 1997. Okay. I go up there asking him, what's the status was... on, my, okay. on my car? I call numerous times. He's saying, well, I'm 
uh, trying to replace the engine, but I can't replace it. The, image, the engine is damaged. There was excuse after excuse. And then finally, I just said, I need to move my car. It's been a year. Nothing's been done. Who, who leaves their car somewhere for a year? Well, he kept giving a good excuse to me, telling me that, you know, he's going to repair it. This and is obviously not your happened. main car. No, right? I have not I have It's a 17-year-old well. car. And uh, I don't know, maybe it was good to store it there and you don't have well, a place no, to park it? No, no, not at all. Because that's so. the only, it's my experience has been that the only people who wait, and of course, you said it was 15 months. How many months was it really? 15 months. Right. I mean, at some point, wouldn't you get frustrated and pull it out? Well, after, you know, 15 months, I said I need to pull it out. So you I have a very high threshold for frustration. <laughs> According to you, he didn't do a bankruptcy for you. No, ma'am, it didn't. Never. Never. He didn't. No. Okay. And you have never said that before today, so I, I, I kind of want to see the bankruptcy papers. I don't have them with me. I forgot them, but I do have a witness. That's kind of that, critical to the case that, me, yeah. it, that you are saying happened. You are telling me I did my part of the bargain. He needs to do his. And if he doesn't, then he needs to recompense me. And you didn't bring the thing that shows that you did your well, part of the bargain? Well, it's just I inadvertently forgot it, Your Honor. What kind I, of paralegal are you? You're not very organized. <laughs> and so what happened? What went wrong with the car that it wasn't ready in 15 months? Let alone okay, a week um, or two. I have papers right here that I purchased a couple of engines that I couldn't, uh, couldn't find a good engine for him. The last engine I bought, it was, it was a rebuilt engine from a company that they closed down. I couldn't get my money back. That's not his problem. Money. Why is that his it's problem? Not, no. Like, in other words, you no. picked two engines? That, three. Three, what, engines. three engines that yeah. what? That the, they, they use engines. And right, I, but they were just bad engines? Yes, ma'am. Oh, but I, the, but I why is that his fault, though? No, I put them on. I'm, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to put no fault on him. It's just I keep on telling him that it'll be better if we get a new engine to put on the car. And what did he say? He said he has no money for that. All right. All right, so when does it, was it really there, 15 months? Yes, ma'am. How did you not want it off your property? I told him many times he was more than welcome to come and get his car. Uh, do any of you have emails or texts to prove which of you is telling the truth on that issue? I believe he has texts. Yeah, because I, have I, text. well, you don't have text. I don't I have, have text I lost my phone. Okay. I don't have them. So when you finally get at, at your wit's end and you decide you want the car back, what happens? I decided to just go ahead and move it to um, another shop. And at that time, he said that I would give you uh, 800 your deposit back, which I have here on paper. And then he didn't and do it? No, he did not do Why it. Why didn't you give him back? Uh, I see a paper where you say you're going to return the yeah. 800. What happened? Yeah, I didn't do it because I didn't have the money at the time. You have money now? <laughs> because why wouldn't you at least return the guy? I, I got a copies right of the papers I received that I paid for the engines. I'm not doubting you on that. I'm going to assume that you really did buy three engines and the three engines didn't work, but you're the professional and you're the guy who's, you know, if you can't do the job, just return the car. I mean, or, you know, but instead of buying engine after engine after engine that doesn't work, that's yeah. not, like the customer's not going to pay you yeah. for buying engine after engine that doesn't work. You, you recognize that yes, because you said, yes, I'm not trying to put the blame on him. No. So there's a series of texts back and forth about a month ago, a little over that, where he's telling you he's going to have the money for you. Oh, you I don't have it today. Give me to Wednesday. Sorry, I didn't get some capital I was supposed to get. Then you call the next day and text the next day. Is the money ready? No, sir, I'm sorry. And it's not going to be ready tomorrow. One more day, please. You say that every day. Tomorrow's the absolute deadline. Borrow it if you have to. Then you text him the next day. Nah, waiting for the mail. And then you just, that's it. I kept giving him right, now, So now you're suing for a new paint job. Tell me about that. Yeah, Because you had a 17-year-old car that needed a new paint job. Yeah, actually, the paint job on it was actually pretty good. Do you have a picture um, of the car before you gave it to him? Uh, no, but I have pictures of the damages to the car. Right. That there. proves that your car has nicks and scratches. I saw all those pictures. Okay. What you have to prove to me is that he did them. And somehow he has to pay you $4,600 for a brand new paint job on a 17-year-old car. Because a 17-year-old car usually has nicks and dings. So if you want to prove to me that that's his fault, you know, first of all, watch this. Did you nick and ding his car? Did you create body damage to his car? Not at all, man. Okay, so now you've got to prove that he did. So the way to do that is to show me a picture of a car that doesn't have the nicks and dings before you gave it to him 15 months ago. Do you have that? I don't have a picture. Of it. Yeah, it's not going to fly too well. All right, insurance for 15 months. Why would he pay your insurance? So are barter deals riskier than regular cash deals? What do you think? I definitely, I would like a piece of paper that says what I have. I think it's very risky. 
Would you do it? I mean, would, it, 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 would you actually do like barter, like an, I'll do your bankruptcy, you give me a car engine? Is that a dicey thing? Yeah, a lawyer may think his time is worth more than an accountant's. And the guy's not even a lawyer, by the way. What do you say? Well, if I knew the guy, yes, but if it's a complete stranger, then well, I mean, that's a, well, I'd take that chance. You know what most lawsuits are? Yes. People who know each other. I, yeah, there you go, going inside the courtroom. Well, my car was, you know, he didn't fix my car, so I figured that I would add those damages in. Since yeah, but you made a decision as a big boy to pay your insurance, and you made a decision as a big boy to leave it there for 15 months. Nobody made you do it that. Wasn't, it wasn't my choice, it's just that no, I no, didn't it want was, to. No, no, stop, it was totally your choice. I take my car in somewhere, they're not fixing it, I take my car back, that's it. You, you know, it was, believe me when I tell you that there's only one thing I'm certain of in this case, and that is that this was a convenient storage place for you, because there's no other reason to give a guy 15 months, okay? Because I can create life in less time than that. 15 months to fix your car, and I have, all right? <laughs> Um, so I think that you are right that you are deserve money back because I don't think anything he did means that he should be able to keep your money. Um, and I am going to order in this case that the defendant return to the plaintiff the sum of eight hundred dollars. Everybody understand? Okay. All right. Good luck, folks. Thank you. Well, the barter deal gone bad. Step on over here. He will get collect on you and your feeling coming out of the courtroom here. Good. I'm good. Yeah, so why'd you keep the car for so long? Why, what? I didn't keep it because it was my choice. It was his choice to leave the car there. You didn't mind having his car well, stored on your property? I could, I, yes, I mind. I could have put a lien on the car and get rid of the car in less than three months. Mm -hmm. And I didn't because I gave him the benefit of the doubt. And he did his work it. for you, right? No, he didn't do nothing. No, nothing for me. You got nothing out of him? Nothing. Only the 800 bucks. All right, all right. You step around the corner here. All right, sir, so you had to sue him and you got what you sued for. Well, not everything. You kind of tried to fatten the goose a little here a little bit. Yes, I felt like I was do that, you know. All right, so you still have this car? Yes, I do. Well, how old is this car? It's 17 years old. Why, why, are you, why are you keeping this car around and keeping it all fixed it's up? It's a collector's item, you know. Yeah, I like yeah collecting cars. All right, Harvey. Okay, okay uh, Kurt. I got to tell you, with barter deals, even more important than cash deals, to get it in writing and nail down all the terms. And that will do it for this case. Litigants for the next case on the way into the courtroom right now. These are the plaintiffs: Sheila Jackson, James Osborne, and Gary Baldwin. Sheila says she and her co-plaintiffs loaned her niece, the defendant, money so she could get out of jail after being arrested for assault. The defendant promised up and down to pay them back but hasn't and has been spending money all over town instead. The defendant's behavior is unacceptable. They want their money. They want it now and are suing for the $1,830 they're owed. This is the defendant, Sharita Stanback. She says she doesn't owe money to the plaintiffs. She owes it to the bail bondsman. The plaintiffs never actually put up any money for her. They just co-sign in case she failed to pay the bail bondsman back. She is indeed paying the bail bondsman, doesn't owe the plaintiffs anything, and thinks the judge will agree when presented with the evidence. She's accused of not behaving in a responsible manner. All parties, please raise your right hands. Welcome back to the People's Court. Next case on the docket, the plaintiffs co-signed for the defendant, their niece, for bail money, and she stiffed them. But the defendant says she owes the money to the bail bondsman, not the plaintiffs. It's the case of don't bail on me. Thank you, Douglas. You're welcome, man. Okay, Sheila Stanback Jackson. Yes. James Osborne. Yes. And Gary Baldwin. Yes. You are suing Sharita Stanback for $1,830 that you say she still owes you for posting a bond on her behalf. Okay, what is your relationship with the defendant? She's my niece. And She's my niece by marriage. And? I'm the father. You're her father, okay. What's going on? Um, April 25th, well, a couple days before that, she stabbed her boyfriend, needed a bail. Honestly, wrote okay, letters Okay, slow down, hold on. Did, what happened? Um, got into an argument early in the morning. Um, I blacked out because I don't actually remember it actually oh, happening. Remember, no, I don't actually remember it I happening. I stabbed somebody, I remember. What happened? Why'd you stab him? Because he was choking me. Mm -hmm, that's a good reason. What'd you stab mm -hmm. him with? A knife. 
Okay, what kind of knife? Kitchen knife. And like he, it was happening in front of my kids. So that's how what badly I did to was he hurt? Uh, he received um, that. I, from my understanding, he received the band aid and the prescription to get pain he pills for ten. No, just received a, just put a. What ended up over. happening to you with the case? Like, um, I went to jail. I spent 27 days in Salem County Jail. I had asked her if they would sign for me to get out of jail. Wait, we'll get to that one second. Oh, okay. I wanted to know what actually happened with your sentence. Did you plead oh, guilty? Oh. What happened? Oh, I was found, um, I received uh, did probation for four months. Did you have a trial or months. did you plead guilty? The prosecutor wouldn't drop it, so they ended up giving me probation for four months. She gave me probation. Right, you agreed to that. Yeah. Okay, that's called a plea. Okay. So you took a plea to probation. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, your bond in order to get out was $35,000, correct? Yes, that's what it was dropped to. All right, now, how do you guys come into the picture? She wrote a letter to my sister Rosemary pleading with us to bail her out. I had a total of $988 of her money that she had me take off. Whose money? Sharita Stanback's money. Okay. That she had me take off her card for her. But in order to bond her out, the bail's bondman wanted $3,500. And we told them we didn't have $3,500. They said, well, we could bring them the money that we had and we would have to be co-signers, but she would have to sign a contract agreeing to pay them a certain amount of money a month. She agreed to pay them $200. What money did you have? $1,030 altogether. Okay. So $1,000 went towards paying the premium because the way it works is there's a $35,000 bond and you have to pay 10% as the fee to the bondsman because the bondsman got to eat. That's how he does his business, a 10% charge. So the $30 was a filing fee. So the 1000 of it went to actually bringing down the fee. It went to mm -hmm. paying the fee. And that 1000 you are saying 988 of it was her money. Yes. Okay, and then what happens? Then it left the balance of 2500 Right. We bailed her out. She went and signed a contract with the bells bombing, agreeing to give him $250 a month. In the beginning, she did some payments. I think I did one payment for her in the beginning. Then, when you say you did a payment for her, did she give you the money to make the payment or you no, made it? No, that was the payment own? I did because they called and they said they didn't get the amount that they, she had agreed upon paying them, which was the 250 Right. So I took them some money. Okay. How then, much money did you take them? Um, $50. Okay. Time went by, time went by. She wasn't doing a payment. We started getting calls from the Bells bombing saying we need a payment in. We would call her. She would say, I'm trying to work something out. I don't have the money. So it got to the point to this year, they said if they didn't get their money or we didn't sue her for the money to pay them, they were going to freeze all three of our accounts because they said in a year. So, okay, but I, I misunderstood because when I read your complaint, my understanding is that you put up, and I'm quoting directly from your complaint, after we put up the 2500 to get the defendant released, but you didn't put up no, 2500 no, You never put up any money. No. Other than the $50. Right. And then and who's uh, James? Kaya. Okay, you put up a little bit of money too, right? Like you actually paid the bondsman $80, yeah. right? $70. Right? Mm -hmm. And then who's the guy who pushed you to a side and wanted to raise his hand while she was talking? <laughs> yeah. You didn't put up any money. Yes, I did. did. Okay, how much money did you I put up? I paid $150 to the bells bond a couple of times. Okay, how come your name, somebody gave me a printout and your name's not in here at all as having paid anything to the bail Because bond. they usually put it in They would put it in her name when he did the payments. Why wouldn't it be put in his it, name it, if it he did the payment? It depends when he went to the bail bondsman. That's how office. the bail bondsman, when you gave him money, he put your name. When James gave him money, he put James' name. So why wouldn't he just put Gary's name? Because actually, when I went and paid it, they had put Sharita's name. And I said, no, I need my name because this is not a payment from Sharita. This is a payment from myself. When you go in, they start the receipt off in her name unless you tell them you're paying for Sharita Standback. So why didn't he do that? I don't know, but I know I did. <laughs> How can you prove that you paid any money to this bond? Um, probably the tape that's in the bail's bonds are in place. Do you have it? No. Oh, well then. <laughs> but uh, there's no problem with that. How much did you say I didn't notice till I left. How much do you $150. say? $150. All right. I didn't notice till I left. Let me talk to you, Sharita. Did you pay? So the reason that you're here is because you don't want to get your bank accounts frozen. Right. You want right. to make her pay the bail bondsman. All right. Now, how much do you say you have paid the bail bondsman? So would you sue your niece if she stiffed you? It depends how much, but yeah. I mean, oh, 1800 bucks. Get her. Get her. Would you sue your niece? I would want to teach her a lesson, yes. So you'd sue her? You're pretending to teach a lesson, but you want your money? Yeah, yeah I would. Okay. I just wanted you to be honest about it, okay? You want your money, right? 
I do. Yeah, going inside the card room. I really don't know how much I've paid the Bells bombing myself, um, but the lady just told me today with the Bells. Which was? It's 1830 Yeah, she said it was dropped down, actually, to, to 1830 But as far as what they're all saying they're paying, none of them ever told me that my aunt never said she put up $50. My dad never told me he paid 60 or whatever. You $70. Said. Yeah, but I never knew that any of them Before they sue you, they don't tell you? If I'm not wrong, my uncle, because he's the one How are you going to pay this? Imp- I'm looking for, like, I mean, at the, like I explained to them, with the charge that I had, it's not that easy for me to find a job. With the charge that, when my charge started out as, it's not that easy for me to find a job. But I've been looking, filling out applications and looking for work since then. You can't get any job, any dough at all no, to I'm, pay these pe- the bondsmen back so that they don't go after their accounts, after no. your aunt and uncle and dad put their names out so you can get out and you can't figure out a way to pay anything? That, since that's the thing it's not that I'm, I'm not neglecting the fact that they I'm, well you are neglecting if I'm you haven't paid anything since Jan, was it, when was the last time you paid something probably last year okay then what the heck because is that I'm not, not neglecting if you can't pay $20 all right if you can't pay anything if you're not paying anything in a year then how do you call that anything but neglecting see this is why you should have just stayed in jail and people should not come to help you you're right it's kind of really bad that you do this to your father, your uncle, and your aunt. It's kind of really bad. The problem that you guys have is that this case is not ripe for you to bring to court yet. You're not out anything yet. No one has frozen your accounts or taken your money yet. See, if they take your money, then you can come to court and sue and say, hey, they took $100, $1,000, $10,000 from my account. She now has to pay me because I'm out something. You can't anticipatorily have a lawsuit. You have to wait until the actual thing happens to be able to have a lawsuit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to dismiss your case without prejudice for you to be able to bring it back up if and when that actually happens. So... What can we take to the bail's bondsman that is going to keep them from freezing our Not account? Not a thing. Because that's what they're in the process of doing. Yes, they I know. just waiting for us to come from. Because they're the yes, ones that I told know. us to take her to what small claims court. What you can take court. to them is $1,830. Then you close out your problem with them. And then you sue her. Because then you're out something. Then you can show me that you're out something. But you can't sue her because it's something you're afraid that's going to happen that hasn't happened yet. You get what I'm saying? Actually, right. I'm not afraid it's going to happen. It's in the process It's going to happen. Gonna ha- I can guarantee you it's going to happen. It's happening. It's Absolutely. It's no, I guarantee it. I know, days. like, the sun is going to rise tomorrow. It's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what happens when right. you co-sign on, a, on, on, on an aggravated assault charge. It happens. If she's not going to pay, you're going to have to pay. That's the essence of your signature. I understand. Okay. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Next time, let her stew in there until so she and her lawyer figure it out. That's what you got to do. It's horrible. I hate to say it. It is so horrible. All right. We did it because she had so much to lose staying in there, and we just wanted to help what her. What does she have to lose? I she was in the kids. process of losing her kids. Did she lose her, her kids? She, she lost, lost one, one of her kids, but she still has one. She and, has a house? And she was able to keep her house. Wait, she owns a house? No, rent. Oh. rent. Like, oh, oh, oh. she would have lost a place for her and her kids to live. Yeah. So we thought we was doing something right. You know, what does she do all day? I don't know. I only only see her sometimes. I mean, you know, if she was hustling and had a lot of bills and was trying to make everything make ends meet, I might have some sympathy for her, but I don't have any sympathy for her. If I was hustling, I'd be in jail. I'm not, I'm not out to do anything wrong. You've been out of jail for a year and something and you haven't seen fit to pay anybody anything of the people who are. Listen, you listening to to her? Let her sit in jail the next time. No good deed goes unpunished. Okay? I'm ruling the way I said. I'm ordering the money that you can prove already has been paid, paid, and I'm keeping that case open for when a consequence happens to you. Okay? Okay. Good One luck, question. folks. So do we send it back to her or send it back to her? I don't know. They can do nothing to see <laughs> Well, it, from the testimony in the case we just saw, it looks like you took advantage of the people who cared about you. Here, step in a little bit. Uh, and that uh, you don't care. Um, how is that not the case? How is that a misunderstanding? Explain. Like I said, because I'm not working. It's not that I don't care about them mm-hmm. at all. It's not the case. What is the case? I'm not working right now. When I find a job, I don't have a problem with paying the bills. I'm right now. I'm not working. All right. Yeah. All right. Head right down this way. Okay. All right. Uh, so she t- looks at you here. Step up. She looks at you as she's walking out, and you two exchange. What was that look about? She got a nasty attitude. 
she needed to learn to be responsible. But you see how she was talking to the judge. The judge wouldn't let me speak. Leave her in there next time? Uh, yeah. Because I had to hear my wife like a chicken. I told you not to. You know what I mean? It ain't about the money. It's the principle. It's like I can pay it off just like that. It's okay. the principle. Harvey? Kurt, I got to tell you, the next time she goes to jail, let her sit there. Um, it is called tough love, but it is the only way, the only way you will teach her a lesson.